conversation or how does it tell me absolutely more about it? i i have uh i have seven students from the doctor of computer science that will join us and ask you questions on innovation and leadership and um, there may be some questions from Facebook Live, so I have a second monitor to, to look at and watch to see if there are other questions coming in. Um, well, I'm, tech savvy. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying. You know what? After you gave me that private, uh, <laughs> that private demo, I was so excited. And so I said, well, how much does it cost to, you know, uh, get a breakout room? And, uh, but th these are all institutional costs. Uh, to the universities. So, so yeah, it's, it's one big old cost for everything. And it's really one small cost and it includes everything. So it is so well, amazing. You what Zoom is you get it. Doing. Oh my goodness. It's incredible. Yeah. All right. So Pastor Love, we'll make sure you get it too. All right, hon. That'd be great. It's so good to see you. Same <laughs> here. Same here. Excited about tonight. Now, Karen, you told me I didn't have to study and research. So it's going to be what our real thoughts are about some things. Yeah, amen. Nice. So Dr. Rowe is joining us. Um, I mentor Dr. Rowe. She is an um, EDD uh, yes. graduate, newly minted doctorate from uh, Grand Canyon in organizational development. Yes. Congratulations. Good, good, good. Uh, do you know how, do you ever know like how many people you're expecting to be on a call or on your calls or is it? You know, whoever shows. No, no, it's whoever shows. Sometimes it's just uh, the, me and the person I'm interviewing. So, cool. but okay. but but the we have the YouTube feature and podcast feature as well, uh -huh. and also it will be posted on my website. So, so some of my students are joining us. Doctor huh? Love, would it help you right. if I let them in? Would that help you out a little bit? Oh, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. Indeed. Yes, yeah, Sandeep was very, very engaging today. He answered all of the questions. He participated and did very well in the discussions. So I'm so glad he joined uh, this cohort. On his way to be Dr. Sandeep. Yes. Right. <laughs> oh, there's Dr. Desmond. Yes. And Deja Bora is a guest. She's, she's also in the uh, Doctor of Computer Science program as well. Beautiful. Hello, Dr. Desmond. Hello, Sandeep. And you'll have to let me know. I don't know who to call doctor. I'll call everybody doctor something, I'm not sure. Everybody wrote a first name, I don't know. I don't know how to call everybody. Yes. And who is um, Bora 11, do you know? Yes, that's Andesia. Uh, she is a candidate for the doctoral program in computer science as well. And this one that's connecting now, uh, you know him very well. Yeah. Michael. <laughs> hey, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> You're not showing your face, son? He's on mute. Oh, I wish you would. Hi, Abby. He needs to unmute. Hey, Michael. Oh, How there he is. Him? Yes. Good to see you. Wow. Can't, can't hear him. And there's Dr. Stein. Hi. Oh, beautiful. There. Dr. Desmond, are you going to show your face? <laughs> <laughs> I know that, Hello. that she lives on the East Coast. And she has some Virginia experience and, and uh, Baltimore experience and New York experience as well. Great. Uh, tomorrow I will show my face. Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> We're having lunch tomorrow. <laughs> it will take that okay. long to put my face together. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is now 6.30 there. Alfreda, Dr. Messi, I am recording this session. And so I just wanted everybody to know that it is being recorded. Um, welcome everyone to the first Friday Night Chats of 2022. I'm so excited. I wanna welcome everybody to the platform. Um, 
My name is Dr. Karen Love, Vice Chair of the Love Family Christian Foundation and Program Chair of Organizational Leadership at Judson University. Co-hosting with me tonight is the lovely Professor Dana Parch, Department Chair and Associate Professor of Exercise and Sports Science. Dana is also a doctoral candidate for the D-Lead Program at Judson University. When I started Judson University, the, I started Judson University, I'm sorry. When I started this journey on organizational leadership, I had many, many questions um, as I was taking the role of program chair. Number one, what is organizational leadership? Is it human resources or leadership development? Um, how does this discipline in organizational leadership teach us about strategy and data mining and com cultural competency, applied decision making, and intergenerational challenges? How does this discipline teach us how to identify patterns and trends, identify deficiencies in the process, or communicate effectively, creating a narrative for the C-level suite? So those are some of the questions that I have grappled with. So God laid it on my heart to start uh, this platform in organizational leadership, inviting many leaders from several different industries to talk about leadership and organizational leadership. What I want to know is about their leadership journey. How does their experiences encapsulate who they are in their identity, in their profession, and in their faith? So through the uh, Friday Night Chat platform, leaders from diverse sectors share their leadership development expertise, team dynamics, organizational culture, strategy, data mining, cultural competency, and entrepreneurialism with the diversity of thought, dynamism, and change. So tonight, we are inviting to the platform Dr. Elfrida Massey. Welcome, Dr. Massey. Thank you. Yeah, I'm so excited. <laughs> Dr. Massey is educated at John Hopkins University School of Education, receiving her master's degree in education and focusing on guidance um, and counseling, and then her PhD in education administration from the University of Maryland. Uh, she is currently the vice president of K-12 Strategies, uh, where she leads the K-12 Strategy class a team of class to provide a platform for Zoom strategies and learning tools for the virtual classroom. Uh, she's also an HR professional, part of the Step Up uh, HC. Did I say that correctly, Dr. Massey? So, yeah, it's fine. Just keep going. We're good. Okay. <laughs> With extensive experience designing and running human capital programs for some of the world's most exciting organizations, creating innovative solutions across the full spectrum of HR needs. She was the chief development officer from, um, from GEMS Education America, where she created a strategic business development plan consistent with the company's growth goals, led day-to-day -day operations, managed a multi-million dollar budget, managed accounts from large school districts. So she'll tell you all about that in the turnaround school. And finally, she wrote this book called When the Music Changes, So Does the Dance. I had an opportunity to read that book and cry and read that book and cry and read that book and cry because it really does challenge you with identity who you are so she has massive information a wealth of information to share with us tonight and I just want to give her the floor and just say Dr. Massey welcome to the platform thank you so much uh, I have to say this first of all just you gave a brief introduction to some of the folks from your university who are online and I just see the names of some people that I know Dr. Higdon Dr. Desmond and um, I'm just hoping that all of you will participate in this conversation because we, including you, Dr. Love, we and Aunt Doctors Love, Dr. Michael Love and Dr. Karen Love. I mean, we, we have so many leaders already on this call and um, you know, everything that I am and, and a lot of the skills and my experiences, um, they've been successful in large part because of many of you who are on this call. So feel free to join in. We've said it's gonna be a chat. It's not gonna be a lecture. Um, we're not going to be talking about what's in books. We're going to talk about what we believe and what we know to be true from our experiences. Amen. So, so do you want me to continue or you just tell me how, how do we want to, to, to move forward? Yes, let's continue with this fireside chat. Okay, and share your experiences. Okay, and just, just, let's just have a conversation. 
Okay, so I'll talk a little bit um, about my background and experiences. I've had uh, over 40 years of experiences in public education. And um, I, I'm gonna age myself and at least 15 more <laughs> in um, supporting uh, public education. I have a deep passion and a commitment to um, helping students and their families to succeed um, and in helping all children and all students and all families. And most of my work has been in serving um, families who I believe are either underrepresented, who haven't always been empowered to have a voice. Um, children, you know, when we say all, in my mind, all means all. It means kids who are homeless, kids who are disabled, um, kids from rural communities that may not have the same resources that we have. It means kids who are um, um, in the juvenile um, system or in, in, in um, who are dropouts. Um, so I think, you know, when I think about education, I don't just think about mainstream, and that could be at the K-12 or higher education level. But, you know, my passion in life has always been to think about, you know, how do you help those who may not be able to help themselves? How do you help families who may not know how to access education in the way that I might know how, or that some of us on this call? So I've always considered myself to be an advocate for some of the underserved or an advocate for communities that might be underserved. Um, so, you know, part of just who I am is to, in acting out that commitment, I try to, to demonstrate that commitment in leadership roles. I've tried to demonstrate it in my personal life with my own family, um, in my, my church community, because I am active in that community as well. Um, and now in my current business, I always believe you have a job and a job. So, you know, and the bottom line is if you show up as your authentic self, people will understand that. There's kind of the job that's in the job description. And then you know um, what you are called to do. And um, I'm gonna say, sometimes you are called to lead, sometimes you're called to participate, and sometimes you're called to disrupt. And um, I have to say that, you know, if I am acting in uh, what I believe to be uh, best um, for students, for families, for people in general, for employees. Um, and that's kind of my North Star with how I behave. I try, um, it bothers me when I see leaders or people who are, um, I guess I could say schizophrenic. You kind of one way when you're in the office or one way when you're at the university and another way when you're with your family and another way, you know, when you're hanging out with your friends. So I think um, authenticity is just so important. I think showing up and being present is important. Um, I believe that leaders um, lead by example, that we do um, whatever it takes to make the organization successful. And that means doing things that, you know, some people may consider to be um, lower than their, their pay grade and taking on challenges that may be higher than your pay grade. So um, I think I'll start off with that and um, if I had to describe my leadership style, um, and I know a lot of us have read about servant, servant leadership. Yes. So I would consider myself, you know, that's a type of leader that I am. Um, I think I am collaborative. And I really believe that um, more leadership comes from those who we are responsible for than from us. So I believe that from the ground floor, the people lead up. Um, I don't expect um, that I would have most of the answers. I expect those people that I am either teaching, those that I'm working with, I expect us all to have the answers and to bring, to think about solutions. And I expect us all to be um, uncomfortable at times as leaders, because I think um, that's how we grow. And that's how um, innovation, that's what innovation stems from, is us being uncomfortable and curious and always trying to think about um, how can, I, how can I make this work more exciting? How can I help people to be um, more passionate about the work? How can I improve the services that we deliver to others? Um, and how do I just continue to grow a, as an individual? So I'm gonna stop there and I hope others will kind of chime in and maybe sure. talk about their views about leadership or maybe tag onto something that I said, maybe it sparked something in your mind. Dr. Massey, um, and since we are dealing with a COVID environment right now, how do you create a positive culture for the organization 
and with the mindset that it will be sustained over time. Okay, um, so I'll say a couple things, um, Dr. Love. I think we are in a, COVID is a type of pandemic. I think there are many pandemics. I think we have always had, um, we have always lived in what I consider to be a VUCA environment where there's been some volatility and that's, that's a military term. Somebody in the military on this call might understand it, where there's always been some uncertainty, um, where there's always been change and where there's always been some, and complexity and there's always been some ambiguity. So I think, you know, we can look at this as this is an emergency situation and we can be kind of stymied by it and, and, and operate as though we are being reactive in an emergency or we see it as just another change that we need to be thinking about, you know, does it propel us to do something different? So I think if we're looking at this time as, well, we're in COVID and let's come up with how do we do, what do we do in an emergency situation to handle it? I think we'll come up with maybe not the best solutions to the issues that we're dealing with. If we look at it as, okay, here's another challenge for us. So given that we've had a disruption in terms of, you know, um, going, going into buildings, going to universities, going to school. So one way to look at this is so knowing that there have always been interruptions, whether they have been weather interruptions, whether it's been, um, you know, health interruptions, whether it's been for, for other calls, economic interruptions. You know, so if we look at it this way, okay, given that interruptions are going to happen, given that this may not be the only pandemic that we will ever experience, more than likely it won't be. So how do we put structures and processes in place now? And how do we think about what we've learned over the past two years so that when we move forward in the future, we are already prepared? So I think we think about it. Okay, so we've learned, think about what have we learned? And then think about, so ideally, you know, even in this situation, how do we best meet the needs of different people? Because one size doesn't fit all. I mean, even if you think about this current pandemic, there are many strategies that are in place. Some of them have to do with isolation and quarantines and vaccinations. Think about restaurants who, you know, had to be innovative. You know, all of a sudden we had restaurants who were, you know, opening up in their parking lots or who were delivering food to people. We had um, communities, you know, where I, I know one community where firefighters were trying to figure out how to get food to people in the communities. You have schools who all of a sudden were thrust in having to decide how do we educate all students? Now, the reality is we weren't educating all students before the pandemic. Okay. At the university level, before the pandemic, you really weren't meeting the needs of all students. So we, we, we've always tried to have, typically we have a one size fits all program or one size fits all strategy. I think what we're learning is we have to have multiple strategies in place to deal with whatever happens. And again, there's always gonna be unpredictability. So we can't assume once we get through this, like, oh my gosh, it's over. Let's go back to business as usual. There is no such thing anymore in my mind as business as usual. I mean, there's so that we can predict the future to, to a certain extent. But I think if we start thinking about our work, um, not in terms of um, space, facilities and buildings, there are many empty buildings today. But what we're learning is if you can educate students without thinking that they have to always be confined to a building. I mean, if we took the building out of the picture and said, okay, we have a job to do and our job is to educate all students, all students who are interested and in wanting to be a part of our university, we would have a different mindset in terms of how we're gonna think. If we weren't um, limited to, well, school has to happen, let's say K-12 school, um, nine or 10 months of the year of the year for six to seven hours a day. What if we took that out of the picture and just said, okay, what do, what do students need and what's the best way to educate them in an ideal situation if you didn't have buildings? Mm -hmm. So of course you'd have to think about technology. What if, they did, what if you didn't have buses to take kids to school? We have a community here, my sister worked there in Montgomery County, Maryland, where bus drivers called off one day and just left kids stranded. I think it was yesterday, you know, left, left thousands of kids stranded. So I think 
again, if you think about uh, where is it, Colorado that has fires, I think we have to start thinking, I think we need a different mindset in terms of how do we um, innovate and how do we plan for our future. And again, in education, we right now, I think the structure limits us because we think buildings, we think nine to five or evening, and we're not thinking about combinations of possibilities. And maybe we're thinking about it. And then, of course, you know, ways to use technology to help us to, to meet those um, ends, ways to use our capital resources, and even ways to do funding. And the other thing that I will mention, just as I am looking at the faces, a lot of us um, on this call understand what it means for organizations and for um, universities and schools and communities to band, band our put our resources together, to think about how do we really act as community and behave as community in solving problems. I don't think just educators solve the education problem or the education them. challenges yeah. or issues. I don't think doctors are the only ones that solve those issues. I mean, I have doctors that reach out to me and say, you know, we, we look at patients. You know, we, we're taking into, your, into account you, what you're thinking. I think we need parents. I think we need the entire communities involved in looking at all of the issues that we're faced with. And I think we've come up with different solutions. You described the very definition of, of innovation. I remember when I started in education, I uh, was working at a, a junior college and my I, I resent saying this, but he was my master teacher. <laughs> but he says, he took me to an empty room. He said, what should happen here? And the conversation was not about the equipment in the room where it should be situated, but what should happen with the students? How do we innovate them? How do we ignite them to think beyond the circumstance? If we had to sit them in an empty room, what would happen? And he did that to prepare me and to shock me as well, to question whether I want to go into teaching. But I love that experience. I love that conversation because it forced me to think innovatively what should happen here. So I love your example about what, what if we take the buildings away, which basically that has happened. Dana, you had a question. I'm sorry. I jumped in too soon. That's okay. That's okay. I'm just, I'm just hearing so much about forward thinking, looking ahead, understanding that challenges are going to be there. How do you um, combat the naysayers? Uh, I'm reading right now about the, this concept of the devil's advocate, right? We always have those people in our organization that um, want to say, well, what about this? What about this? But they don't come up with solutions themselves. How do you, um, how do you work with those individuals and collaborate with them? Well, I'll say two things. Um, I think um, you can focus on the naysayers or you can focus on the one or the two or the three and put your energy with those who understand. So I think the first, so, so my first thought is people really have to understand the vision. I mean, there are times when, you know, we don't spend enough time helping people to see or to understand so that they can even, um, some of you catch the vision so that they can even join in. I think um, one, having clarity on the vision is important. Um, and I think you, you know, you have to help people to see that everyone's not going to see it in the way that you do. So you think about different ways to be sure that people understand your vision, what it looks like, um, you know, uh, what it might take to get there. I mean, there are a lot of things around visioning. So I think you, you, you come up with a strategy to do some visioning. And again, you're always going to have naysayers. That, that, that's a fact. But I think, you know, again, you focus on those who kind of get it because those are the people who are going to help you to move the needle the fastest. And sometimes you have to, and, and also recognizing that sometimes you have to go slow to go fast. It may be best as you analyze kind of the obstacles and, you know, it's not just the naysayers, it's, you know, what are all of the things that might be impeding you from reaching your vision? And I think, you know, you have to just decide you only have so much energy, physical energy, you only have so much resources, where are you going to spend them? Yeah. So again, I, I think you think about who are the people that are supporting it? And then how do we then help to kind of, those are the people who are gonna help you to move it. One leader doesn't do it. A leader with no followers is not a leader, but a leader who can get kind of a volunteer army. Um, that's some of Cotter's work. He talks about getting a volunteer army, helping them to see the vision. Coalition. And, yeah, and, and the mission, and you kind of move with that. So that's the first thing I would say. And the second thing I would say is that, some people who are, those who are opposing, um, it's important to hear them 
and to hear what they're saying, because sometimes, um, you know, the opposition may not be to the idea or it may not be to you. It might just be based on their past experience. Because a lot of us are stuck in, well, in the past we tried this and it didn't work. And why are we doing this again? So I think kind of listening to people, really listening and trying to, to gain understanding for people who disagree with you. I think it's important to have people who disagree with you in the room. Because I found that some of those people, you know, once you reach um, some understanding or at least a respect for, you know, what they're thinking, what they're saying and what you're thinking, that you can still work together. You don't always have to agree with everything, but you might find areas that you do agree in and how you can move forward in that. So again, I, I'm not sure if I kind of rambled with that, but I think, you know, you never shut out. Um, people disagree with you, listen to them. And I think, oh, the other point I wanted to make is, I think we should all have a North Star, you know, and that's our beliefs and our values. And what guides you? What's your guiding principle? And what drives you? And you stick with that. So I think, you know, there'll be times when there are disagreements, there are disagreements or, you know, people don't get it. And it's really, it, it may not be that important. But it, it, if it really, you know, I think you have to decide kind of where that fine line is. And for me, it's like, I'm very clear on what my values are, on what my principles, you know, uh, uh, my beliefs and principles. And that's what guides me. And that's what helps me when I'm, whether I'm making tough decisions about who's going to be on my team, who my ride and die buddies are. There are a couple, Dr. <laughs> Tesman is on this line. I have to acknowledge her. You know, she, she's been a disruptor all of her life, an educational disruptor. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why I say that as a good thing, because she's always challenged the status quo. And I think we need to have people who, in our organizations, who look at what we're doing. And at the point that we say, oh, this is good enough, we need people to say good enough isn't good enough. We need, we need people to help us to say, to ask some really tough questions. The fact that students are sitting in our classrooms, the fact that they're taking exams, does that really mean that they're learning? Do we really know how to assess what people know or what they've learned? So I think, you know, you need people with you. You, if you need to be surrounded with people who are not satisfied with the status quo. And no matter what your city, what your situation is, your setting, your classes, that they're always kind of, you know, kind of nudging you with, okay, you know, we need to do this better. Have we included these people? Have we done this? Have we considered this? And, you know, there are times when, uh, you know, because we all have our own biases and sometimes we just like, no, I want everybody to agree with me and let's move on. And we don't want to take the time. But, um, and the biggest reason I've heard from people with why, you know, it's like, we can't, we can't deal with the naysayers because it takes too much time to explain and to help and to listen and to understand and get them on board. But if we take that time, and even if you get one or two of those naysayers who get it, they could end up being your greatest supporters and they could end up being your greatest leaders. And, you know, they could end up being the more creative folks who are going to help the organization and help you to grow. Excellent. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I wish I could have said, just fire them and get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> Mohammed has a question for you, Dr. Massey. Okay. Yes. Uh, so like Dr. Massey, hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? I'm good, I'm good, thank you. So I just have a, like, a, like a small question, not a big one. So like, who, who like inspired you to be a leader? That's my question. Like, um, yeah. yeah uh, so, so let me just say this. I, I'm, I never thought about like, uh, I don't think about myself uh, as a leader as much as who inspires me to just um, to, to focus on excellence, who inspired me to, um, to, to always try to do my best, to strive to do my best. Um, so I, I, I'd have to go back really to my, um, my grandparents, my mother, my family. Um, and um, well, I'm going to get ahead of myself. But I'm going to say one thing and just put a just put it in the parking lot. I think we need to be family for other people. So in my case, um, I I have been for as long as I can remember. I've been surrounded by people who loved me, who thought I could do more than I could do, who encouraged me, who gave me space to fail, and um, helped me to learn how to be independent. Um, who um, didn't back me when I was wrong, which I think is important. 
um, who, 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 who made me accountable for my own um, uh, behavior, good, bad, or otherwise, there were consequences. And I paid, a, I, I spent a lot of time being, uh, paying, paying for things that, decisions that I made, make for bad decisions, let me put it that way. So I, I would say for me, it stemmed from family. I know that everybody may not have that. Um, and then outside of that, you know, I've been fortunate that I've had mentors and I've had friends and some of my mentors have been people that actually reported to me and um, I learned from them. Um, so again, I've always felt that, um, I've always felt that education was important. I've always felt, and I've been taught that people have to um, stand up for what you believe. And that instead of being um, an onlooker, um, I come from a family that believes if you think something's not right, then what are you going to do to make it right? What are you going to do to make it better? Um, I, you know, my thought is, you know, I don't believe I'm looking at any of us. I think if you really put your mind to wanting to do something, that you start um, putting a plan into place and thinking about how to get there. You know, otherwise there are a lot of people saying, oh, I wish I could and I want to, but I never, uh, Muhammad, I never sat down and said, gee, I want to be a leader. I think I want to lead this or that. Um, I think people saw um, skills in me or they saw something about my character. And more often than not, I was invited to leadership positions. Um, and there are some that I've turned down. You know, I, I don't want to be in a role to lead just because, you know, the, the, the position, the title is good or the pay is good or um, the company is whatever. In fact, I tend to work with startup companies that are starting from scratch. I, I've, I've tended to, to enjoy, you know, one or two people with a great idea and inviting me to think with them and then, you know, kind of and then growing in a leadership role in that way. We can all be leaders. Everybody can be leaders. Now, let me let me just talk about that piece that I wanted to put in the parking lot. So I think there are some people that grow up in homes, and I don't call them dysfunctional, and I don't think people, for the most part, are dysfunctional, but grow up in homes or grow up not in homes, where they, they, they don't have um, people surrounding them, helping them to understand. Um, they may not be deeply rooted in faith. And I think there are those of us who are, I believe that we have a responsibility um, to, to um, Pastor Love, I looked at you, so I'm going to say this, to minister to those people. I think we have a responsibility to help other people to understand that they can be um, successful, that they are loved, that they can, um, they can lead, they can teach. Um, that's why I love being in settings where there's peer teaching going on. Um, I started working with kindergartners and second graders and then fourth graders. I mean, I taught a lot. And then in middle school, I was a counselor and I worked with, you know, crazy middle schoolers who were adults one day and babies the next day and then 12 and 13 year olds the next day. I mean, you know, they're going through all those changes, maybe all in one day. Um, <laughs> and um, my greatest joy with the work that I've done has been helping to lead, helping to guide those young people. Um, helping them to understand and to see how they are valued, um, how they are all going to be leaders, you know, and especially kids who, you know, they send kids who were um, the ones who acted out the most used to get sent to the guidance counselor. And, you know, I'd, I'd look at them and I think, yeah, you know, you're going to be a leader. I mean, they're going to lead, you know, you can lead a gang. They used to lead their gangs, their posses and all that. I was like, you got skills. I like, I, I hope kids to say, you, you've got skills. You know, any skills you can turn around, they can work for good. No, you're going to work for good or for bad. Yeah. So that's good. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that experience. Thank you. You're welcome. I don't know if I answered your question at all, Muhammad, but I no, hope you kind of got the drift. Of that was like, uh, you know, uh, so like uh, very, so like you shared your experience, like, you know, from the beginning, you said everything with the family. That was the, uh, First part, I found that, like you say, like uh, from family it comes. So thank you. Thank you so much. For that. You're welcome. May I comment about Dr. Massey since she chose to comment about me? I've known her for a number of years, decades. Um, she, she was, and, and this is directly in reference to her. We, we, we've been very honest with each other over the years. 
as we've known each other spiritually, et cetera. Um, leaders, and Dr. Massey alluded to this earlier, she does possess, as many leaders do, you have to have those characteristics. You have to have that knowledge, those skills, those abilities. However, beyond that, there's the realization that people choose to be led and they also choose who will lead them. And if you do not come with those qualities, those people skills, et cetera, no matter what you know, they will identify you as necessary, essentially for a certain purpose or project, but they will not choose to be led by you. Um, I've often told Dr. Um, Massey, who I, I consider one of the most brilliant people I've ever known, that um, one of the differences between um, herself and myself is that she is what I call a total package. Yes. She is a leader for all seasons and for all reasons. Um, earlier you had, and I'd like to make a comment I'll um, pay for your lunch tomorrow. Then I intend to start at the top of the menu. Um, <laughs> and, 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 but take what she said earlier, um, that, that approach to leadership, instead of looking on persons who disagree with you, with, that who might disagree with you or disagree with others, instead of looking on them as a distraction, that we should view them as an, as an opportunity um, to increase perspectives um, from which we will consider different topics, et cetera, or different approaches to, to, to a subject. That comes with that leadership skill, but that's also what draws people to that type of leader. And um, that's enough about that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Desmond. Dr. Massey, I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, so in your book, you said it's not about race, but about culture, not about religion, but about faith, not about gender, but about tradition, and not about pride, but about dignity. Now, we grew up, we grew up in, in, in the 60s on, and so there were times where we weren't afforded the best of education, and we were not privileged, but we were able to sustain because we had our family, and we had our hi history, and we understood the culture, and it was cultivated in such a positive way. And one of the things that you shared in your book was the fact that your family now will caucus whether there's failure that, or crisis or celebrating one another when something positive happens in your life. How have you been able to sustain that type of leadership style and sustain that type of positive culture within your family and beyond? I'm gonna to respond to that, but I'm also going to um, take a minute to acknowledge that one person from my family happens to be on this call. I'm okay. Dr. Deborah Higdon, <laughs> I happen to see her on. Uh, this is my sister. My sister Deborah is on. She's a uh, former retired principal from Montgomery County Public Schools. So, so I'll just say, hey, a couple of <laughs> and I might say Minister Deborah, but uh, so, so a couple things. Um, again, I'll talk about my family. Um, so we've always had a family of. Um, I mean, we've always been kind of rooted in strong faith and. Um, that stemmed from, again, great, great grandparents, you know, who were enslaved and, um, and I come from a family of activists and fighters. And when I say that, I mean, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Love, you've read my book. I mean, I've come from a family where um, my grandmother, you know, when we talk about the golden rule about treating people the way you want to be treated. Uh, we grew up in a family where we could fight, we could argue, but, but there were some tenets about that one. We were never allowed to call each other names. Now you think about that, kids. I mean, we were never allowed to. The word hate was not in the vocabulary in our houses. We couldn't even come home from school and say, "Oh, I hate that teacher." My grandmother would say, "Wait, wait, wait what do you mean?" You know, <laughs> you know, it just wasn't a part of our 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 in our family. The other thing is, we always lived um, when I was younger. Um, we lived in one house. My grandmother lived in the next house. Her aunt. We were very poor. We lived in a housing project. We had to help each other to survive. My mother worked three jobs. My mother and I ended up graduating from college together, but she started out 
cleaning people's houses, uh, uh, cleaning the homes of, of wealthy Jewish folks in Pittsburgh. Um, she was a crossing guard. Um, and then eventually she, she, she was um, a school secretary. And eventually, you know, she started going back to college. Um, I think it took her 20 years. She probably took one or two courses a year. <laughs> and she and I ended up graduating from college together. But we've always had to, one, pull our resources. We were forced to. When my mother worked, my grandparents helped in terms of feeding us, babysitting us. Um, so we always had our own little kind of supportive community. And again, we had norms. We had some beliefs. We really believed that you have to respect each other. We could say things to each other. We didn't fight in our house and, and we didn't argue. And it's, well, you know, my sisters and brothers and I, every now and then we kind of get in some little tussling fights um, until the adults, you know, adults couldn't see us doing that. So, and, and I realize that's kind of rare when you talk to some people to say that, but when we were children, I mean, we had values. We weren't allowed to fight even in school. If somebody hit us, I mean, there were times when we were pushed to the edge and we did fight, let me be clear. We yes. did, but we were, we had to really, it had to be a really good reason. And you better explain why somebody's trying to beat you up. Yeah. Exactly. And you had to fight just to save your life. Yeah. And we could, we could find those excuses, by the way. We did a couple of times. But um, so we grew up in a family where, you know, um, the, the values were clear. Um, it, there weren't a lot of, you couldn't make up a lot of excuses and situations to work around what those values were. And those values were respect for each other, um, respect for God, respect for um, adults and other adults in our community. Uh, we grew up with values. My grandmother cooked for the entire community until she was 80 years old. Mm -hmm. My grandmother, um, if anybody in our community needed food, uh, and my sister can vouch for this, my grandmother cooked every Saturday um, from when we were children and our job, you know, she baked rolls, we were to deliver, to deliver food to, we just took it all over the community sure. um, because somehow people, my grandmother always seemed to know who was hungry or who had kids that they couldn't feed or, you know, people who needed a ride. She would, you know, uh, uh, not on school days, but on the weekends, you know, especially when we learned to drive or when we could walk, we had to go to the store and get people's groceries and bring it to them and yes. get food from our own house. So we grew up with that. We grew up knowing that um, you have to, you're not just accountable or responsible for yourself. You're responsible for other people. You are not given resources. You're not blessed just for yourself, to, for self-indulgence. If you have, uh, you know, if you have things and you're blessed to have enough, whether it's material things, physical things, um, then you're responsible to share with others. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of all I knew. So as a teacher, that's what I knew. Um, I'll, I'll just tell one last story. My father was a bus uh, for a short period of time. Um, he, he drove a school bus. And my father happened to be very compassionate. He drove the special education school bus. And uh, how, how, see my dad, maybe he was in his seventies when, or, or about 70 when they hired him as a bus driver because he knew all the kids in the neighborhood and he had the license. And um, when he would come home and tell my mother that, you know, some of the kids on the bus didn't have lunch, my mother started fixing um, just bags of lunches every day, took them with my father, gave to the kids on lunch. So uh, one day he got on the bus and uh, my mother hadn't sent just lunches for the kids. So uh, the kids were hungry. My father decided to take them all to McDonald's. Now, you, you have to understand this is this. And this is kind of how my family operates. He took a bus load of, of kids who should have been in school to McDonald's, uh, <laughs> treated them to breakfast. Yes. <laughs> didn't, didn't think about the fact that by now the police are out looking for him and the children. And, the children. You know? <laughs> and by the time he got those kids back on that bus and in the school, you know, he lost his job that day, right? I mean, he lost his job. <laughs> and he, he, you know, for a long time, he couldn't understand it. And he kept saying, but the kids were hungry. I couldn't take them to school but they were hungry, you know? So there are times when I think about that, I say there's some decisions that we make knowing that it might cost us our jobs or it might, you know, we've made decisions that could cost us our lives. I was reading about the life of Sidney Portier today since, you know, he, he passed away and there are a lot of articles that talked about, he was saying, 
more important than being an actor was the fact that he could be an activist. That more important than anything else that he did, that the most important things that he did in his life were the times that he put his life in jeopardy. It's like, wow, in my mind, that's leadership. You, you, don't, you, you are willing to lead even in the face of adversity, even if you believe that it costs your job, it costs your life, it costs you know, what, whatever, you, whatever you value as being important. I think that's the culture we grew up in. Uh, I, it's interesting, one of my relatives was looking at his kids and he said, uh, the kids were on their devices and he said, uh, that's a lost generation. We're losing a whole generation to devices. And that is very, very sad because despite all the challenges we went through, because my mom wanted to make sure we went to the white school. As soon as it was integrated, my mom, my mother told me that myself and my younger sister were going despite how we felt. So we had to go through the white community to get to the school, which was fine. And I met a very lovely girl. Her name was Carolyn Sampson. We became best friends. And then she decided to invite me to her house, uh, uh, to her mom's surprise. Uh, her mom screamed and there were in words and things you know, that were shouted. And uh, we were horrified. We, we didn't understand the language, but we knew that it was bad. So. My friend and I decided to uh, prick our fingers and become blood sisters. But having said that, it didn't matter about the danger because we always had the comforts of our family. We always had identity, we always had history, and we could go back to those things that made us sustain those troubled times. And so I'm, I'm praying that this, this generation that's coming up now does not lose that connection with their history and their culture because, um, you know, it's a sad story when you're not connected to community as we were. Yeah, so thank you for that. Uh, you, uh, is there anybody else who has a question? Because I have lots of questions. <laughs> I want to, yes. Feel free. Uh, let's I'll let Dr. Deborah go. Yeah. Thank you. I think mine might be a quick answer. Um, Dr. Love, you just mentioned something about um, this generation not being as connected to family. And what I see is with a lot of the young leaders, I think that's one of the reasons they're experiencing so much burnout. Um, so I'm going to ask Dr. Massey, how as a leader do you balance this need to do all of these things that you've talked about that are necessary and needful, and yet at the same time, make sure you're taking care of yourself, that you're giving yourself that self-care that is necessary, not just in the pandemic, but all the time? Uh, that's a good question. That's something that I'm working on, trying to learn how to do better to, 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 uh, in terms of self-care. So I think, you know, it, it reminds me of um, the fact that leaders, you know, if, if you don't, you know, like I said, you only have one well of energy. You only have, you know, if, if you can't take care of yourself, I mean, we've all heard this, the saying on um, airlines, put the oxygen mask on yourself first in the event of emergency so that you can take care of others. So I think it's important. Um, I mean, I think that's just always important that we think about um, during every day, you know, how do you, I think through, med you know, how do you meditate through meditation, um, through reflection? I think it's important. And I'll just mention this, even as leaders for me, I, I never just get up every day and just run to my computer or go out the office to the job. I, I think it's important to take time to get centered, to think about your day. I mean, almost envisioning here's what my day is. And intentionally, so I think as leaders, we have to be more, more intentional about, and how do I stay refreshed? And how do I stay centered? And how, because if you are kind of frazzled, um, other people are going to pick that up. And, and all of us give off a certain kind of energy anyhow. And I think um, in my case, I have to learn how to be quiet. I have to learn how, when I say I have to learn how to be quiet, well, be quiet, I talk too much anyhow, but learn how to be quiet within myself. I literally have to set aside, I mean, and that's what I had to do maybe in the middle of last year, because I'm also a caretaker in my home. I, I had to think about, okay, um, I, I, I'm, I'm giving, 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 I'm going, 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 I'm running, running, running. I'm, you know, how, how do I change? How do I just shift that dynamic so that I feel better so that the, those that I'm interacting with will feel a, um, a sense of calmness and not a sense of, 
you know, rushing and pressure because most of us know if any of you and all of you have been in leadership uh, positions and you work with leaders where you just feel like, oh my gosh, they're always, they seem stressed. They're always pushing us, pushing us, pushing us. Well, but when you're around somebody who's kind of like centered and, um, you know, they feel, you, know, you, you pick that up. It's almost contagious. It's like a smile is contagious. Mm. So is your energy. So is, you know, your leadership style is contagious as well. So I think, you know, for me, um, I'm, I, I read a lot and I now find time to not just fit it in. Um, I have right now on my calendar, my, my, um, my electronic calendar, I have every day, I call it um, network, I think I call it networking, networking, or yeah, I call it networking. And I set aside one hour and that hour is not interrupted for any reason, mm. unless there's a fire. And during that hour is when I have two books that are sitting on my shelf. I sit down and read that book. During that hour is when, you know, because we've been in so much because of COVID is when I go out of my neighborhood. And when the weather was warm, I realized I didn't really know what my backyard looked like. I went, I start, I take that hour and sit on my porch. And it's amazing how my mind gets clear. You know, I, I watch my neighbor's kids playing. I watch some deers. I didn't realize how many deer there were in the backyard. You start to notice things. When you slow down, you start to notice things. So I think that's a gift that we have to give to ourselves is to slow down and, you know, not, notice what's around you or slow down and read and don't put off, you know, they're not New Year's resolutions. They should just be life, ways in life that you regularly um, give yourself, that you, that you get refreshed or if you give yourself a break, because we all are in different situations. Some of us live alone, and that time might be the time that you start, you, you decide, let me interact with other people. You might be a person that music is something that you just sit down. But I, I've learned that sometimes you hear, um, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll say, I, I can say, sometimes I feel like I, I can hear more clearly the voice of God or the voice of others or my thoughts when you take that time. And again, for me, um, it's at the very beginning of my day, my first 30 minutes, and then I've now blocked off an hour. For someone else, it might just be before I turn in at night. For somebody else, it might be before I go home and have to deal with the kids and my family or my, my roommate, my partner, what, whoever. But I think we, we owe it to ourselves because um, something happens in the brain and the mind when you free it up, when you unclutter it, um, you really do start to see a little clearer and you start to get some ahas. And then you wonder, how did I exist without giving myself this, this time for myself to reflect, to meditate, to grow, to, to you know, sort through and think about you know, what, whatever you need to think about. That's good. Thank you. Other questions? I just I do have a question. Um, just uh, looking at the background, it says uh, part of the background is designing and using digital tools in K through 12 classrooms. Huh? And I want to bring that um, and how it relates to the pandemic. I have been talking to principals, teachers, parents, and what they're saying is that we are at a two year gap for students and we're talking about digi using digital tools. So one, where did we go wrong with digital tools? You know, that we have this huge gaps because supposedly we went digital, right? So can you just talk a little bit about that? How do we use the tools and what did we miss or, or how could we have done things better so we don't have this huge gap? And I'm not even talking about the underserved community. I'm talking about general. Mm -hmm. um, so you're talking about in education, right? In education, correct. Yes. So I'm glad you said you're not just talking about the pandemic because um, one of the things I said earlier, we have always had a gap. So a couple of things. One, um, it's important for us to think about how do you measure learning? So, and I love to talk about, you know, people are talking about learning loss and there's this big digital gap. So two things, when you say, where did we go wrong with digital? Uh, one place we went wrong was we thought that because we just had technology or we're using digital tools, that that was to do something. 
digital, I mean, digital tools are either a platform, um, they are a tool, they are that, they are not the answer. You can't just put kids in front of a computer, give them a computerized program or, or adults and think that all of a sudden learning occurs. Um, you can't just hand teachers or instructors, um, you know, some digital tools and say, okay, now I'll use these, now you're good. If people aren't trained, I mean, there's significant training and understanding of pedagogy. Um, there, there, there are, there's a lot of research about how people learn. That research is not new. It talks about how you, you start with looking at um, students' uh, preconceptions and misconceptions, how you then provide facts and help um, adults and students. And it's not how kids learn, it's how people learn. You help people to put together facts to form some conceptual frameworks. And then um, that leads to meta metacognition where you then um, want people to start to take uh, responsibility for their own learning, to then um, have deeper learning and, and for knowledge to occur. If we were to actually follow the principle, research principles on how people learn, and then you think about whether it's computers, whether it's digital tools, whether it's artificial intelligence, you, how to best use those to support the learning. If you're expecting that they're gonna cause the learning, that doesn't happen. Um, if, if you put them in front of people, you have to understand teachers, uh, you know, adults, teachers, professors, instructors, they're still good pedagogy. And there are many of them that, you know, they have all of the technology, all of the equipment in the world. And, and how are they teaching? One, they may or may not be utilizing it in the best way. And they're still doing whatever, they're still teaching the way they were taught, whether it's 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or 50 years ago when they were in school. One of the things that there are a lot of studies have shown that teachers typically teach the way they were taught. And you can put, you know, I remember when we introduced computers in classrooms, and I can tell you most of the classrooms they were used as coat hangers. I can tell you now, there are a lot of students that have Chromebooks, they have all kinds of devices. And what do they do with them? They read email, teachers that have emails, you read emails, I mean, have, have computers, you check, your, you check your email, you go on Facebook, you do some other things, you play some games. Now it's possible. So again, as we think about that learning gap, you know, um, the, the, the gap is not, in my opinion, it's not directly related to the pandemic. I think the pandemic just highlighted it and helped us to understand how severe it is. And the other thing that I let people know is, People were learning and students were learning during the pandemic. It's what they learned. Many of them were learning um, some decision-making skills. Many of them were learning how to be independent. Many of them all of a sudden had to figure out their own schedule, their own day, learn how to be disciplined and to have study skills. You know, many of them, you know, there are many students who thrived with online learning, quite frankly, because they're, you know, people learn their different styles. Some people loved it. I had two granddaughters. I had one that loved it and one that hated it. One that said, oh, I love this. I love being online. I can, I can go at my own pace. My teachers are now allowing us to do projects and to do research on our own. And then she said things like, I can get a snack when I want to. You know, I don't have to spend an hour and a half uh, being transported to a building and an hour and a half coming back. I can keep my pajamas on if I want. And she just felt so free. And we just watched her blossom. She started school, you know, face to face this year and was doing better than she did last year. And there are other students that are just kind of left to their own with a machine and maybe, you know, a program. Programs don't teach. Machines don't teach. They are exactly what they are. They are equipment. You have a car. You can have the best car in the world. And if you don't have a good driver, if you, if you don't have the right person behind the wheel, if you don't have a person that knows how to follow directions, can you really get to where you want to go? Uh, prob probably not. Powerful ana uh, analogy uh, there with a, with a driver in the car. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Okay. Uh, Dr. Massey, I have a question from Facebook. And then after that, Dr. Rowe will ask her question. So here's a comment and a question from Jennifer Mattingly. She says, I think there's a difference between emergency remote learning and planned, well-designed online education that follows best practices. I think we have a better, a bigger PR issue to combat for digital online learning because of the need to quickly respond 
to a, to a move to digital learning. Thoughts on how leaders can message and promote best practices. Okay, first of all, I have to say, I agree with her 100%. Um, and so I think there are two things. When you think about remote learning, there's synchronous learning and there's asynchronous learning. So with asynchronous, you know, I mean, that's when you can go on anytime, you know, you're pretty much on your own. It's like doing independent study. Um, I happen, and partly because I'm with class and I'm with a company that um, we are partnering with Zoom to build some teaching and learning tools to make it not just a conferencing tool, but you know, to make breakout rooms more vibrant and um, to do different things to, to building out a totally new, different type of whiteboard um, to make just a lot of, you know, you don't have to leave the platform to, to show a video, you know, just with using click of a button or tabs, being able to, to, to do easy things. What's important is even with online or virtual learning, you know, good pedagogy is good pedagogy. Having um, good content is, is important. And I think for teachers, you know, it's not a matter of, okay, you know, now you have online learning. I don't think it's an either or situation, first of all. I think we should have options so that um, you have the best practices in place for both online, hybrid, or face-to-face. -face. And best practices include, again, great instructors. You, you know, not just somebody that knows, you know, I know I'm, I'm the most tech savvy, so I'll do it. I think you still have to have great teacher training. I think teachers still need to think about how to have a rigorous curriculum. I think they still need to build it up based upon standards and to have assessments that are based upon those standards and, and the curriculum. And I, mean, I think everything that you do in a, in a regular classroom, you know, you don't forget about all of that when you're thinking about virtual learning. So one, I think the platform itself is important that, you know, you need to think about a platform that, you know, many platforms were just built for conferencing. Well, teaching is far more than just conferencing, you know, which is why one of the things that we're thinking about is how do you build some teaching and learning tools so that you can have your syllabus right, you know, in your classroom, so to speak, so that, you know, if you want to uh, give an assessment, you can do that right away. If you want to have private chats with students, if you want to invite parents to, to, to visit in to see the class or to have a parent conference that you're able to do that. Um, and again, I'm a big proponent of peer teaching and peer learning and having students, you know, really begin to take responsibility for their own learning, how, how to make it exciting. But again, there are basic principles that um, should be in place, whether you're face to face or in a virtual setting. So I think what's happening is people are saying, well, this is good enough. I mean, you, you go to an, I, I don't want to, you know, I'm not going to do com commercials. You know, good enough isn't good enough anymore. You can't just say, well, we use this and, you know, it's fine and it, it should work. I think we have to spend just as much time thinking about how to build up, build the platform and to build the instruction and the lesson plans and everything else online as you do face to face. I'm not sure that we do it really well either place, either way, face to face. I mean, I think there's room for improvement, whether you're um, bound to a building, whether you're bound to space. Uh, or, or whether you're doing something online. Yeah, very good. Thank you. I have a question from Dr. Rowe, and then I have two questions, and after that we will close out. Otherwise, I'd have to pay you. <laughs> Dr. Rowe. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Love. No, I just wanted to commend you, and, and because of what you guys were talking about in the past about family and stuff like that, I myself was a foster child and went from GED to PhD. I didn't, I was, I'm a Gen Xer, I didn't have that support, and, yep. you know, when it comes down to what you were mentioning about personal reflection, that is so golden, because that's how I start my day, personal reflection and prayer every day, because the faith in God is what has carried me to where I am and who I am now. So I just wanted to thank you for that. I really enjoyed everything you said, but even more specifically that. that so it wasn't really a question. It was just me commenting. Thank you. Jay, um, you have two yes, questions? I, yeah, I have a question. Uh, this is Sandesh. I'm taking a leadership course. So my question is, how do you change your leadership style when you approach a project in a nonprofit sector compared to a project in a private sector? 
because people who participate in those two sectors have different motivations and value systems. Okay, so are you saying, how, how do you, what was the first, can you repeat your question one time, I'm sorry. Um, how do you change your leadership style when you approach a project in nonprofit sector compared to oh. a project in private sector? I'm glad you asked that. I've worked in the nonprofit, uh, non-profit sector as well as um, the um, corporate. You don't, that's what I said. You don't, you don't change. I, I don't think you change for me. I have never changed my leadership style. I think what's important is that you understand, um, you know, what, what the end result is, what the motivation is. If, when I'm working for corporate, I understand that profit and, you know, uh, gaining profit is the most important, you know, outcome, you know, because you, you have investors, um, you know, it's different. And nonprofit, you know, um, I, 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 again, I, I've never, I don't see any difference. I think it has to be with who you are as a leader. So wherever I am as a leader, I bring who I am and I go to that place in an authentic way. I understand the first thing is, you know, we have to be smart. I understand the goals of the organization, whether it's a nonprofit or a for-profit. You have to understand that. Um, people will respect you for who you are in the organization. You don't have to, you don't have to tell, I don't have to tell mm. and talk to people about my faith, my background, my religion, my style, anything. People start to know who you are and, and um, you stand on that. Now, let, let me just give an example. Um, so in every organization I've been, I think I've said to you, I've always, you know, one, I consider myself to be an activist. I consider myself to be a people person. I have strong faith. Um, and I make no bones about the fact that I um, believe in equity. I believe in equity and providing equitable opportunities for all people. Um, and in every organization I've been in, there, there's come a time when um, some tough decisions had to be made and there have been other designated leaders, not me, but people have come to me when they wanted to, to determine, for example, my most recent place, the National Center on education and the economy. When the situation happened, um, I uh, can't remember now the exact day with George Floyd and Amon Aubrey and a lot of, a number of people came to me to say, what should we do? One of the things that they knew is that um, I stand on principles. And um, so, so I say that, say that, and I was asked by the company if I would help to lead our effort to demonstrate that we were going to become, we were, go we were going to demonstrate that we were an anti-racist organization. Now, did I ever go to anybody and say, you know, I, I'm, uh, I believe in anti-racism? No, never. Did I ever go to anybody and say, I believe in diversity? No. No. Did I say this is something I want to do? No. But um, I can't even tell you the number of people that came to me and said, I think, you know, you got to help us with this. I think you need to help us to take the lead with it. At some point, you know, when the CEO mentioned it to me and I said, of course, I'll take the lead in this. And, you know, and the way I took the lead, um, I reached out to the company and to people that I thought maybe even had a different perspective and said, I'm wondering if you might want to help me with this effort. You know, and I kind of talked about, you know, and I wanted people who had different opinions. I wanted people who thought this is a crazy idea. And I really wanted to get a diverse group of people. And I had some people that I approached and said, hey, why don't you join us? You know, we're going to start thinking about how to taking on this project. Um, for the company. And I had a few people say, well, why me? I mean, it's, and I'd say, well, why not you? Let, let's talk about that. And, well, you know, I have a different opinion. I said, that's great. We need to hear you. You're probably not the only one in this company that feels that way. Um, I was at another company when 9-11 happened in Chicago. And in that company, and, and you know, on this call, we can talk about our, our beliefs and our, our, our um, beliefs and values and our faith. And in some places I was, I've been with companies where that's just a no-no. But when 9-11 came, here's what happened. Um, I was on my way to the airport, got a call, don't go to the airport. Don't, don't, don't get on American Airlines. My daughter actually called me. So I went into the office, I go into the office and I walk in and Dr. Love, you may, may remember that because we were living in Chicago at the time. I go in my office and I have at least eight people are just in my office before I get there. You gotta help us. And I say, what's going on? And they say, something's happening in the world today. And, uh, and I will tell you this, I have one guy, um, 
who happened to be um, a Muslim. I had another guy. I don't know what his, what his um, religious beliefs were, but he happened to have been, he's Indian, but I can't say exactly what his faith. I had a number of people. I had uh, one person for sure that I knew was Jewish. They all come and said, what are we going to do? We need to pray. We need to do that. So my thought was, and I thought about this a lot. How did they, I, had, I, I was kind of a, you know, I was one of the vice presidents, but I wasn't like at the top. So people know who to come to. I work for a company right now where we have a head of IT. We have lots of positions. I know who to go to when I need somebody to, to when I want leadership. And it's not always the person in the designated position. So it doesn't matter what organization you're in. You act on your own beliefs and values. You understand the values of the corporation. And if you're working there and you're committed to those, then you use, you bring yourself to that, you and your team, and, and try to help the organization to grow, whether it's a nonprofit, whether it's a university, a school, you, you do your part. And that's what I meant when I said some people I think are schizophrenic. You know, they behave one way in one setting, one in another. I, I, you bring your authentic self and your skills and with an attitude of wanting to, low, to, to, to learn and to grow and to help people. And that's just my, that's my North Star. I don't know what yours is. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that Jay? Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Deborah, and thank you, uh, Dr. Karen. Uh, I have two questions, uh, Dr. Massey. One question is, as a leader, how do we overcome challenges? Question number two is, as a leader, it's very difficult if I put my legs in anyone else's shoes to express my disappointments in a team, but still get motivate can you help me understand these two questions how is how can we overcome challenges and how do we express as a leader the disappointments to the team and okay. still get them motivated so jay, jay cut up some of your some of your questions cut out did anybody so the first oh. one was how, how do we overcome the challenges uh, as a leader how do you overcome just challenge Yes. Um, I think part of it is, is perspective. You know, it depends. How do you view challenges? Do you view challenges as, uh, do you first of all, you don't take them personally. That's the first thing I say. I, I, I think, you know, that's the first thing. Don't, you know, when, when there are challenges in organizations, many times people assume that the, they're challenging me. And then you, you, you get all into your feelings and, you know, well, they, you know, they, it may not be about you. I think you have to, you have to ask for more information. You seek information. You, you, you ask people, you know, if you're being challenged by individuals, you know, one, I think you handle challenges privately to the extent, initially, to the extent that you can. And sometimes they happen in a public forum. You, you need to understand the person, if it's a person and giving the challenge. But I think you need to figure out what is this really? What is the person really challenging? What are, what are they um, upset about? What are they against? Maybe they, maybe there's really something to that challenge. You know, and maybe, maybe, maybe there's something that needs to be challenged. And sometimes people don't know how to express that, that, you know, so I think, so I'd say the first thing is, um, one to, 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 to not uh, immediately take it as a personal affront. That's the first thing. So I think you've got to think about how do I look at this objectively? And again, it depends whether you've had history with the person, whether you haven't had history, whether it's a challenge that happens in a public forum or whether it's something that happens between you and just another person, you know, in, in a private setting. Of course, in a private setting, there are greater opportunities to address it, to, 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 to deal with the challenge right away, because the first question is, let's sit down, let's talk, let's talk about this. And, you know, you ask questions, tell me more, tell me what your thoughts are, tell me can we talk specifically about what, what you object to? Um, you know, and just listen to the person. Um, you know, did I explain this right? Do you, do you, you know, can I answer any more questions for you? You know, so you start with that kind of a dialogue. And, and the second thing I would say is you know, try, to, try to neutralize any negative emotions. You know, if the person's really upset and if they're yelling, then you go low, you, know, you, you lower your voice. I used to deal with my kids. They start yelling, then I start whispering. Uh, you know, but, uh, so you, you have to neutralize, you have to neutralize it and bring some positivity. 
So I think no matter what you let, you, you know, as a leader, you have to let people know if you're a good leader that um, we're not always going to agree and you're willing to, to have that kind of a culture and to set that kind of an atmosphere that we can disagree. We don't have to be disagreeable. And, and, and you set the norms when we, this is how we behave when we disagree. This is how we're going to disagree. You know, if, if it's something about me personally, please approach me personally uh, and I will make sure that I have the time. If you would disagree with the direction that we're going, um, let's talk about it before we leave the room and let's not have parking lot conversations outside the room. So you, you, you agree to some norms about how the group is going to behave. And then you have that in place for whether it's, you know, for decisions, for things that, 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 that come up. You, say, you go back, so, you know, remember, we agreed to this. These are some mutually agreeable, some mutual behaviors that we all agreed to. And you can decide kind of here's what's in bounds, here's what's out of bounds. Out of bounds might be name calling and cursing and throwing chairs. Inbounds might be you can ask any question. Uh, inbounds might be you can send, you know, we can send notes to each other. Inbounds might be we can talk to each other, but we won't call each other names. Uh, inbounds might be, you know, um, any idea is acceptable to, to debate, to discuss, but it doesn't mean every idea is accepted or that it's a good idea. So you might just decide because, you know, a lot of great things come from let everybody's stuff go up on the board, you know, put it all up there. Now let's talk about it and see what gets to stay. And why? Thank you. That's how you get a team that starts to work together. Thank you. And following up to that question was, how do you express your disappointments in a team, but still make them work? <laughs> uh, well, so first of all, when you say, how do you express disappointment? Um, I think um, when you work with people, they need to be clear on what the expectations for their behavior is, for their work behavior. If that's clear, um, and people need to know, you know, here are the expectations, you know, for you as an employee, you know, if, if it's somebody, or as, you know, if you're an instructor, you know, I'm not sure which setting, but, you know, you have to be clear, here's what the expectations are. And, and um, so when, you know, if they first don't meet those expectations, you, know, you sit down and you have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And you start with, this is what I observed. You always start with what's observable, what you know, not what I'm guessing, not um, describing it and coming with all kinds of adjectives. It's I've noticed that, um, you know, you, you, you know, I've noticed that you didn't, re you know, this report was, was supposed to be turned in on such and such a date. And I've noticed that it was turned in a day late. Can we talk about that? You know what, you know, let's talk about what happened. They might explain, and then you might be clear. Well, you, you do know that there is the expectation that all reports are turned in. Blah 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 blah. Make sure that they understand. They understand it, okay? And then you have to be clear. So, so the next time we have this situation, here is what I would expect. If it doesn't happen again, you know. You, I mean, you know, you, you might be disappointed, but you still kind of go through a process with people. You know, because things happen. You don't really know why you know, what's behind when you say you're disappointed with people. So, you know, the next time you might say, you know, this has happened two times, blah, blah, blah. You know, if it happens again, you know, let, let, let's be clear, as we said, I'm going to have to write it up. If it happens again, blah, 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 blah. Uh, or you might, you know, it might be one of the things that I found, sometimes you have to determine, do people really have this, the ability to do the job that you've asked them to do? That's one. Secondly, do they have the resources? It might be that they don't have the right resources to do what you've asked them to do. You know, and thirdly, do they have the passion for what, what you've asked them to do? Because you're going to be disappointed. There are a lot of people who are, who are just trying to meet somebody else's expectations of them. And, you know, they're really just not in it. I mean, you know, they're, they're just doing it. So you're, you're going to be disappointed. But I think as a leader, you, know, you, you have to get to know your people. You have to get to know kind of what their style is. Um, and when you, you know, if you sense even, and you have to give people an opportunity. To, to, to give feedback so that you can find out and you don't wait, you know, people, you, uh, some leaders do surveys, some leaders just do check-ins, hey, what's happening? Are things okay? Is everything okay? Do you need any more support? Um, you know, how are things going? You got to do some informal check-ins. You know, what's, how, how's the family? Sometimes you get a little lead. How's the family? You might know, how are your children? 
you, you, you never know. How's your health? You know, is there anything you want to talk about, especially if you find that, you know, somebody was performing at a certain level and then they're starting to disappoint you, something likely has changed. You know, do, do, you, know, do, do you need some more training? And so, do, do, do you want to, you know, do, maybe you send somebody else, do, I, do you need a mentor? Do you need a coach? Can I help you with this? Did you give that? Maybe it's too much for one person to handle. So, you know, so when you say, how do you handle when you're disappointed in people? I think you can probably, there are steps that you can do to figure out what happened. Because there's something that makes you, causes you to be disappointed with the person. And sometimes you might find it's you. There are a lot of leaders who, you know, I mean, they're disappointed a lot of people and it may be that they just haven't been clear enough or they haven't set the right boundaries or they, you know, there's something about the environment or the culture that makes people, you know, not want to not perform at their highest level. So hey. as a leader, I'm always looking introspectively at me first. Did I, did I do everything I should have done? Mm -hmm. Did I provide enough support? Did I make it clear enough? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you, I, Dr. Massey. I just yeah. wanted to interject, if I may. And Dr. Massey, I think that is very key, what you said, how it's cultural, because it is cultural. Conflict is cultural, and conflict resolution is cultural. So if you have, a, as a leader, and you develop the type of culture that can resolve conflict and is open for conflict and has established those type of healthy boundaries, then you can overcome those challenges much better, you know? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Deborah. I, you have also been responding to me. Uh, so thank you so much. <laughs> Dr. Massey, I want to thank you so much for uh, just participating and just accepting my invitation to join in on the platform of organizational leadership because it's, it truly has been a journey for me. And um, when I went on my hiatus for about six months last year, God won't release me from this platform. And I am so thankful because I'm getting to meet very exciting people and, and learning new topics and new introspections and, and perspectives. So I thank you so much for that. And I thank this audience as well, because you didn't have to be here, but you decided to be here anyway. This is exciting times, and I am so blessed by that. To my computer students, I will see you at 9 a.m. in the morning, and I know that you are looking forward to spending another eight hours with me. Look at Jay's expression. <laughs> <laughs> tomorrow on a Zoom call. But thank you everyone for being here and God bless you. I'll see thank you next you time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate all of you. God bless you, dear. Good to see you. Bye bye. Thank you. Have a good weekend, everyone. You too. I'm just going to. Uh... Dr. Karen. So. Yes. I was actually asking one more question to Dr. Deborah. Oh, you were? I cut you off? <laughs> no, no problem. But you guys can answer me. So I am 0% in sarcasm. I don't understand sarcasm at all. Oh, like okay. Zero. I am very literal. I am very literal. And I am not autistic, thankfully. I got yeah. myself tested. So I am good there. <laughs> so if I ask someone that, if they're frustrated and they're disappointed and I ask, is everything okay? They get more frustrated when I ask that question. They're like, everything is fine. Why are you asking me? Hmm. If I tell them. Jay, I have a question. Do you remember the first thing I said is start with information. I noticed that blah, 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 blah. Let them respond because they might say, well, yeah, that's only because they'll give you more information and you might be misinterpreting. You thought I mean, just, so I always start with what's the observed behavior. I notice that you're not talking as much in class and the person might say, well, I'm talking as much as I used to and say, oh, it, it didn't appear to me that you were talking as much as you were on Tuesday, you know, so then you're even more specific. Oh, I noticed on Tuesday, or you might say, uh, you give me an idea, what's an, what's an example of, if you were to describe me as frustrated, what behavior would I exhibit that would make you think I'm frustrated? Um, like doing things very fast paced, disorganized, speaking with me or anyone or fellow coworkers rudely using not cuss words, but the tone, like higher pitch. 
Yeah, so that's good. So, so, so Jay, and this is just a suggestion, you know, one of the things that you do instead of saying what well, seems to me like you're pretty angry, you're pretty rude, which is a descriptor, you say, you know, I noticed that you were, um, you know, speaking, blah, 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 blah. You've got to describe the behavior. Here, here's what I noticed. Am I, you know, at, at first I was thinking you were all frustrated. Did I misinterpret that? Sometimes even put it as, a, did I misinterpret that? Or, you know, can, or I sometimes I'll say, can you help me to understand? Because I'm, I'm just an observer and I'm really not sure what's going on in your mind. Can you help me to understand um, that interaction that you just had? Interesting. Yes. You open Thank it you. up for them to give you information, not for you to describe what you saw. Thank you. Then they come back to you and say, "Why? Well, thank you. You don't know me. Why? Well, thank you. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, <laughs> thank blah, you. Blah. <laughs> so since then, I have been very cautious of even complimenting people, especially ladies, because I just complimented that you look good today. And they were like, we didn't look good yesterday. I didn't mean that. <laughs> so I am very, very yeah. careful. <laughs> so thank you so much so jay i, I would be a person because i i do use sarcasm unfortunately and i'd be one of those people said what you think i look do i use it look bad i mean so i get you but that's you know that's one of the things i think it's so important to try to get to know and understand each other and just like you shared with us just you shared with me um i tend to i don't you know i don't always get sarcasm well somebody who doesn't know you might not know that so if i know that I'm not going to be sarcastic with you. I'm going to say, oh, let me break it down for Jay because he, he doesn't like the sarcasm <laughs> stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, would you share with Dr. Massey some of your background? I, I, I love some of the community work that you were involved with. Would you share with her some of your experiences? Sure. Sure. Uh, so back uh, when, I was, when I was studying in undergrad, 10 years back in India, we used to gather street kids. Uh, street hawkers kids and they were educated but um, their education was theoretical like math social studies but I helped them with hygiene moral science etiquettes and mm -hmm. I had to get down to their level to teach them um, things so connecting with them was very difficult and challenging because I can speak the fluent Bill Gates language, but mm -hmm. they wouldn't, for, for them, it's just nothing. So I had to connect them with the celebrity that they like. So if they wanted to become like a celebrity, they had to behave. They had to talk like a celebrity. Oh, I like and, that. And that's how I had to get, uh, uh, <laughs> get in touch with them. And in course of years, I, I, I know Dr. Karen had asked me to discuss this, but I was, uh, I'm a little shy in discussing these stuff because I like doing this stuff. So in course of years, the kids come back to me. One kid com comes back to me and he said that, I, do you remember you told me something uh, two years back? And I, we teach kids, but I didn't remember. And I really felt abominable, abominable about that. And the kid said, you said, if you want to become a celebrity, I have to start to read, write, and behave, and convince my parents to send me back to school so that I get educated and not involve me in daily household chores so that I am mm -hmm. satisfied just for the day. Mm -hmm. So I am back since two years. I am back and I'm moving forward in from fourth grade to fifth grade and fifth to sixth. So that was precious to me than anything else in the world. Because sometimes I don't know what impact I will create on anyone else. So I'm very watchful and careful of my words. And when something like that happens, it makes you feel like nothing else in the world can actually compare to that feeling. You, not a gold, not a platinum, nothing, but you made someone's life. That hey, person God. can make someone else's life. So that is something that I believe in and I, I hope I can do more, but it's just pandemic has make, made me restricted. No, 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 Jay, you know what you need to think, even during the pandemic, think outside the box. We have a pandemic. How do I use those same skills to help other people? You, you will find a way. You may not have the answer right away. Even though there's a pandemic, 
people are still in need and you can still have an influence. And sometimes, you know, share that vision with a few other folks, share with some other people, you know, get some ideas, you know, it's a pandemic. Here's what really, you know, drives me. Here's what really gets me going. Because like I said, there's all, there may always be a pandemic. This may be a way of life. So we can't start hiding behind, well, we not hiding. We can't stop, start behaving like, well, this is just pandemic times and it's going to pass. What if it doesn't? Because after this pandemic, something else is coming. Rev, you know, it's scriptural. Something else is coming. Something's always coming. Something is always going to be in the way. Something's always going to be at us. And especially if you're trying to do right and you're trying to do good. So, so it may be For harder. Sure. It may be harder, but it's not impossible. You just have to think about different and better ways. That's, that's what innovation is about. Think about different and better ways to reach out to young, you know, whether it's young people, young men, those, you know, in the group that you talked about, it may be even helping other, you know, maybe like you have the skills, you know that you already have the skills. So you just have to think about how do I reach out to other people who need me? And sometimes, you know, I mean, that's my prayer. I say, Lord, you know, there, there's so much work that you have to do. Just let me know what part of this work you want me to help you in. Because it's not mine, it's his. Yeah, that's true. You know, it's a Thank matter you. of finding out where else, where, maybe you're being led someplace else. Stop and listen to that voice. What should I be doing? There's always something more that we should be doing to help others. I really believe that. That's true. That's true. And we, especially me, I know when I think I have more problems, all I do is just open news. Yeah. And I get to see people have more problems than I do. And mm -hmm. I feel happy about it. I usually don't tend to watch news in this situation, especially politics and stuff, mm -hmm. because I tend to see what's going around the world. There is a lot of suffering. There are so many oh, yeah. people who need mm -hmm. us. So many people still die of hunger, which is yeah. really bad. Mm -hmm. So I, I'll be more than thank you for the suggestion. I really appreciate. I really, really do. Well, I, I probably gained more than everybody else on the call. It, it really was um, just nice to have a chat. And again, not to have to be intellectual or prepare or do all that just to, you know, kind of chat. It really was a chat. It was. Very nice. Thank you, Dr. Um, Karen. You're welcome. I'm so I know Dana has a question. Um, Professor Dana has a question, but I want to ask Andesia if she wants to ask Dr. Massey a question. I know she's on this call. Maybe she left early. Some people no, left she's, early. she's here. No, she's, she's here. here. I, I can see her. Yeah. I... All right. So, Professor Dana? Uh, mine's kind of, I would say, personal. It's, it's, a, it's something I'm struggling right now as a young professional, as a young leader, um, pursuing her doctorate. Uh, I have many values similar to yours. My family is very important to me. My faith is very important to me. My professional growth is very important to me. And I'm at a point in my life where all of those things are like this all the time. And I'm split in a million different ways. Everyone needs me. I have to be on all the time. What advice do you have for me? <laughs> I have three young children, five, three, and one. And so my head, like on a day-to-day -day basis is just, woo. So, so the first thing I would say, Dana, I want you to think for a minute, what would happen to, if you take yourself, if something happened to you, if you became ill, mm -hmm. if you were rushing and, you know, God forbid we're in a car accident, what would happen to everybody else? If you, if something happened to you, if you became ill, let's just take that. Yeah. What would happen to everybody else? Well, everyone else would have to pick it up and figure it out without me. <laughs> yeah. So here's what I want you to think about. I mean, if, the, if you don't take care of yourself, then, you know, all the things you're doing for others, you can't help them at all. It's important for you to be a mother. Um, did, did you say you have a husband? Yeah. It's important for you to be a wife. I mean, there's always that, that you know, with women who are mothers um, and wives mm -hmm. and daughters, and you have to give time for your mother help take care of your parents yep. and you have to take care of your husband yep. and you have to take care of your kids. Yep. So if you are not in uh, taking care of yourself, you can't do any of that. Well, you can't even do one of those. Well, no. You're right. so, so, so part of my thinking for you, sometimes you have to, you have to put those in three boxes. 
-hmm. and decide where the priority is. Now, for the most part, that priority is either going to be your husband or your children, or if you have parents and they're ill, there are times when, when the priority for those boxes are going to switch a little just because of what's happening in your life. Right. Um, there are times when, you know, you and your husband can pull together, at least and take care of the kids. But I think you, you have to look at those boxes and, you know, kind of look, look at your day or look at your week and say, okay, I have all of this, but what, what really, what are you going to do to take care of yourself? It could just be taking an hour and just being in the room by yourself. Or for me, it's like just getting sleep, just shutting the door and, or going to bed early and not having to yeah. take care of dishes or whatever. And, and part of it, Dana is going to be helping um, anybody that, you know, I don't know how old your kids are. You has, it's, you're going to, have to share that to say, mm -hmm. I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with how to be my best self to help take care of the family. I mean, it's really important. And it's important for you at some point to say that because you're either going to have someone that says, I understand it, or someone that thinks that's crazy. Now you need to know that either way. Yeah. Because if you need to, if that person, you know, if it's your husband, he says, you know, I understand that Dana, um, he's either going to offer, or you might have to say, and I need your help. That's what's hard to do. Yeah. I need your help. I need your support in this thing. Now that, that thing might be something small or it might be, I need your, your help. I need you to help me think about how I can get rid of this feeling of feeling like I'm just struggling all the time to be a good wife, to be a good mother, to, 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 to do all these things. And I, I'm just, because otherwise what you're, if you don't deal with it that way, you're going to start to have physical symptoms that will uh, you know, you'll, you'll start to deal with it in other ways. Your body will deal with it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and sometimes your body will just shut you down. Yep. You'll yep. wonder like, why am I, you know, I mean, literally I know people and I've been there where all of a sudden my blood pressure is going up. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I'm talking to my, my blood pressure. I can't sleep. You know, he says, tell me what's been happening. T talk to me about, you know, tell me about your days. Tell me what's been happening in the last week. Tell me about your days. I start talking to him and then the more you talk, a little more comes out and then I'm crying and talking. And then I'm like, he says, well, no wonder your blood pressure. So let's figure out how to change some things in your lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then you, you, you know, so you, um, nobody can tell you what that is mm -hmm. and it might be small things. Like for me, it's something small right now. I'm a caretaker. Uh, Dr. Love knows this and I don't mind sharing it both. Dr. Love. Uh, my husband happens to have dementia. Mm -hmm. Um, and two different types of dimension that's, and for me to just, um, be in a quiet space, you know, we, we kind of work with it. Um, there are days and even right now where I have to just shut my door and sometimes I have to lock it just so that I can have that hour to sit and to just like, I'm not taking care of anybody, but Alfreda, he's right outside the door, which mm -hmm. is, and now he understands it. Sometimes he'll come and I'll say, do you want me to shut the door? You want me to shut the door? He'll say, Let me shut the door and give you an hour. And I'll just like, yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or I'll say, no, you can come in. But you know, he's got it. Or, or you know, he'll say, um, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna help to start dinner tonight. And I'll say, Well, I haven't decided what I'm fixing. And I'll say, okay, well, but I'm gonna start, you know, and then and I'm I realize like, okay, well, there are a few steps in between. I'm gonna start dinner and I don't know what to fix. But um, uh, so you know, you, you but at least he's trying to help to help me with something. And, you know, if, you, if your husband says no, and I don't get it and all that, then, then that's another issue. You know that you have to change other things and you've got to figure out how to how to do some things differently. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it even means with work to say, you know, I can't do I can't take on this extra responsibility. Yeah. Or it might be, okay. I have a meeting and it's really important and it might be I know it's really important, but I can't do it today. Mm -hmm. That's hard to do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think it is that self-care piece and being able to communicate it. That is like what you, you said, shared that earlier. I was like, yeah, I'm not doing that well. Um, my husband is phenomenal. He's got all the, th all three kids upstairs right now, put them to bed. It's just for me to take that hour. Like, oh my gosh, I'm like, where can I come up with an hour? But I do need to be more diligent about that. So Dana, you start with 15, 20 minutes, then eventually you'll get yeah. there. If your goal is an hour, start with 15 minutes, start That's with good. 10 minutes or figure out where you're going to take that hour from. Yeah. It might be that one of these meetings that every meeting isn't, I mean, don't listen to Dr. Love. Every meeting, wait, do you report to Dr. Love? I do not. No. Oh, okay. Then I can no, no, she's not in well, class right now. Yes, yes. Every meeting isn't so important. Every class isn't so important. <laughs> and you weigh it. 
my health class. Except my classes are, David. Don't listen to them. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes missing the class is worth it for your own mental health or physical health. Students, do not listen to that. <laughs> Stop recording. Stop recording. You have responsibility for your own behavior, your own health. I'm just saying. Reverend Bob, you know, sometimes you have to tell the congregation, I can't today. Got it, got it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Love, sometimes you have to tell Rev, I can't. I just can't. That's right. Oh, yes, yes. That's right. I do. We, because it's important to have that network around you, particularly when you're going through this doctoral program. You have to have a supporting network. You absolutely yeah. do. Uh, you know what? I'm willing to support any of you as you go through this path. I mean, I've been there. It's been a while, but, you know. Dr. Love has my email and she'll give you my yes. phone number. I'm happy to be on your, be a part of your support team. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. And uh, Sandeep has a question for you, Dr. Massey, okay. if you can stay on for a few minutes longer. Sure, I'm good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Like, it's Friday yeah. night. You're my Friday night date. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but I'm sure that like you can answer this like quickly. So like uh, what I had uh, in mind is like every day we are taking a lot of uh, decisions like every day. Uh, so, so when you are taking decision, like how do you remove, like when you take decision, you will decide like uh, you will be having different perspective. Like how do you remove biases from uh, taking decisions? Right. So, so the first thing is we all have biases <laughs> and you have to first just acknowledge them. And, and, and what I've done is um, you try to get in touch with where does that stem from? Sometimes it's a bias about people. Sometimes it's a bias about things. Sometimes it's a bias that you think is good, but to an extreme. So for an example, I'm biased towards, you know, students that I think, you know, you know, that they have to work hard at home and it's hard for them to, to, to be where they need to be. So my bias is I might make more exceptions for them when I probably, I maybe I shouldn't. I'm biased towards, you know, homeless kids, you know, who show up and, you know, so, so part of that bias, the good part is I understand it. And I might understand the resources and support they need. And I might try to make sure they get it. The bad part is I might overlook things because that's, that's part of my bias. Do you follow what I mean? So, so I think the first thing is understanding and some of them are racial biases. I mean, you know, if you, if you are people of color, I mean, and, and you live in the United States, uh, and in other countries, you know, there are caste systems, class systems, um, there's, there's, there's racism, sexism, you name it. So I think part of that, part of that is, again, being very clear with who you are as a person, your own self-identity. You have to have some assurance with that, mm -hmm. that, you know, I know who I am, uh, I'm not, and, and I'm not going to let people tear me down, bring me down, or um, bring me to that level of behaving like them. So, you know, when you say, how do I deal with, what's the question? How do I deal with bias? Yeah, uh, yeah. How, how do you like remove biases like in making your decisions? Uh, so you can't totally, um, I think I kind of just weigh the pros and cons and you know, that's, you're, you're never gonna always make good decisions. <laughs> you make, you decide. Um, so for me, it's, I always have to say, it's in, in whose best interest are you making the decision for? Yeah. So if I'm making a decision and it involves other people, I have to decide, you know, what's the expected outcome and what's what's the best decision that I can make that would be beneficial for, for you know, for that person or for the class. And so you always have to kind of weigh some, you have some pros and cons and, um, and, and again, you have to know what your biases are and own them. You got to yeah. own them. Okay. E even if the, like, if you have give me an example. You loud persons out there. But can you give me a better example so we can talk more specifically? Uh, so yeah, what I was thinking like, so consider like I have to decide something and one one of my close friends is included, like, uh, included in that matter. So I have to make decision like, uh, like subconsciously I'll uh, look more positive points about my friend, right? So while making a decision, like how can I um, uh, not lean into my friend, but okay. I have to like consider everything and take a fair decision. 
Okay, so Sanji, Beth, that's one of the toughest decisions I ever made was firing a, one of my college friends who, who helped me to get, who, who told me about a job, I got the job. She's excited. Turns out she ends up reporting to me and I had to let her go because she did something unethical. Mm -hmm. And um, I talked with her about it and she leaned back on the friendship. I've known you for how many years? I helped you get this job. I, the, how could you, it broke my heart. And, and, and what I had to say was, it's a matter of standing on principles. What you did was wrong. You forged some documents. You put me in a position. So here's, here's what you have to weigh. Mm -hmm. You put me in a position. If I don't do what I know is right, regardless of the friendship, then it makes me, it, it puts, I'm doing something that's unethical. Do, do you okay. follow what I mean? It makes yeah, me, yeah. Okay. And, and I don't want to be that unethical leader. Okay. Um, you know, the other thing is being honest. I was honest with her, Linda. I mean, I'm giving, yeah. I, you, if it's your friend and you have to make a decision, you can't just make it because they're your friend. Now, if there's reasons, well, he's my friend and the reason, I mean, you got to weigh the pros and cons, but it has to really be based on what your real beliefs are and what you think. So I believe in ethical leadership. Yeah. Now, that's not important to you because there are people who believe, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I work for a company now and I think for the most part, friends and families first, forget ethics. You know, so anyone, any one of us could get cut or whatever. So it's got to be, if you're in a situation where that's what you've agreed to, that the most important thing about this is friendships and relationships, then that's what your decision will be made, made upon. You support your friend. If what's most important to you is what's ethical and what's what you consider to be right, then that's what you make your decision based upon. But it's how you treat the person, how you treat your friend, if in fact you can't weigh in his favor or her favor. Got it. Yeah. It's how can you be straight? You want to be known as the person. And even though it was a tough decision, but he really did the right thing. Yeah. Can I can I tag that a little bit with you, Alfreda? Please do. Sure. Uh, so to the students, this is my husband, Dr. Michael Love. <laughs> yeah, the other, the, the additional point on that, because Alfreda's laid it out beautifully, Dr. Dr. Massey's laid it out beautifully. But the, but to answer the question for your, for your friend in, in, in Dr. Massey's case, the what's in it for your friend <laughs> is that if they can take, if they can learn from the lessons of this event, like if you've got, if you've got a situation where they, they forged something, and they have to feel some consequences. They've got to learn the lesson that number one, there are consequences for, for, for the behavior. And since, and since you still have a future someplace else, I've had, to, I've had to terminate a lot of people over the years as a part of corporate. And since you, got, since you need to have a future someplace else, you really need to be able to take the life lesson out of this so that you can adjust your behavior going <laughs> forward and then be successful in whatever the new setting is that you're going in. And, and it's fixable since yeah. you still breathing and, and you still got, you're still walking, you know, you're leaving this setting, it's, it's still fixable. And so it, it leaves them with some hope. You got, it instills some hope even while you're telling them that they're, you're paying a consequence for the event you've just gone through. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and Cindy, there's another thing that I'll mention to you. Um, I used to teach a course on ethical leadership and I've talked about there are three types of decisions that we make. The easiest decision you'll ever make is one where there's clearly right and something's clearly wrong, yeah. easy. The second hardest decision is when you have to choose between two things that are right. Here's a good, a good decision. Uh, should I go this way? Should I go this way? But either way, both, both are kind of okay. okay. The hardest decision is when you have two things where neither of them really are the best. Yeah. Two wrongs, basically. If I do this, a friend's gonna be hurt. If I do this, something else is gonna, you know. So you have two things where like, either way, I mean, they're gonna hurt, you know, there are two things like two, it's like right versus right, right versus wrong or wrong versus wrong. Okay. Now the situation with your friend could be one of those wrong versus wrong. Mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. the toughest decision because, <clears throat> you know, sometimes it's either make no decision or you've got to choose from either of two. And, and, you know, both of them are gonna be pretty tough. And that's when, you know, your, your beliefs, and that's when, well, I talk to people, that's when your North Star is important. What are your beliefs and values? Because that should be the guiding star with, when making that decision, even if you have to choose me, and we've all done that. You've got two bad choices. 
Mm -hmm. It's like, what's the lesser of two evils? You better think about what's your North Star that decides that. And you stay with it. Because if people start to see you being inconsistent, well, this time you, you did this for this person, but you didn't do it for me. Or you, you weighed one way with one person and then another person has a similar situation and you don't want to lean the same way, you got a problem. Correct. Yeah, that, that's correct. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. That's a great example here. If I may say something, if he's your friend, he will not put you in that situation. Yeah. It could be a relative. <laughs> yeah, relative. I, I, I happen to agree with you, but friends sometimes do. They do. That's it depends, harsh. It depends how hard against, how, how much they feel that their back is against the wall. And sometimes it just means too much to them that, you know, they will sacrifice you over themselves or they may not even understand or care about the impact that it has on you. Sometimes friends aren't even thinking about, wow, what position am I putting him in? Self-interest. harsh. Self-interest. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> please, please pray that I don't run into such situations. It happens. <laughs> no. Those excellent Dave, questions. Just, Dave, just resort to sarcasm if you're ever in that position. <laughs> sarcasm will come, into, will come in handy. <laughs> so that's what happens. I don't know. Someone was telling me that you will never feel depressed because by the time things happen to you, the train has already left the station. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I don't know if I, if that was a compliment or that was a sarcasm again. But I, just, I said I'm going to take it as a compliment. That's how I do. There you go. <laughs> I'm going to assume positive. <laughs> That's very good. I, I am very impressed the students are staying on. I, they are, were required to stay uh, until 730, but they continue to ask good questions. And so I think it's wonderful to have this dialogue. And I so appreciate you, Dr. Massey, um, because you have extended yourself to walk this journey with us. You don't know what you've done. <laughs> Thank you. I Thank you, you so much. Leave. I got to tell you before you leave, uh, Dr. Massey, <laughs> that I, I didn't get a chance to slip this in, but uh, I, I was reflecting while you were talking, you were sharing all that wisdom about the, about the time when we were, when you were here in Chicago, and we were here together, and you were with that company that was producing all of those books. Books, yes. Yeah. Or... Yeah, and, and uh, I was really going to point, I was going to see, see, set you up for the vision question to close out to talk about vision and creative, creative leadership, and how when you had those surplus of books and we partnered with the church yes. and to ship all those books to the to third world countries. Yes. That was, that was, I, I, I mean, that, I don't even know. I couldn't remember the value that we tried to put on those things, <laughs> but it was tens of thousands. It might've been a hundred thousand dollars worth of books. Yeah. Cause so I remember we had to send um, like, whole, we had to send crates. crates. And, you know, and, and again, that's just another example of, you know, if you want something to happen, yeah. you know, I mean, to help. I mean, we're with a publishing company and I don't know why other people had thought they're throwing away books that are out of date. It was like throwing away. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And the, the, wow. yeah, that, that was just a beauty, the beauty of, uh, of creative and visionary leadership. Yeah. And, uh, Thank and, you. And, and maybe those who didn't get to hear, hear a little bit of that story one day, because it was it was fabulous and touched so many lives with, with the books that you, that you Well, said. thank you for remembering that. I'm glad I, I remember that. And that's, that's really important. In fact, Dr. Barbara Desmond, who was on the line, mm -hmm. um, she, she uh, now is uh, the education chair for the Maryland State NAACP, but she's done a lot of work in Baltimore County uh, with parent, working with parents and student groups. And she just sent me a photo recently. It's funny that you mentioned books. And it was one of our elementary schools um, in a very poor neighborhood. I mean, they're publicly funded. And she had a picture of us standing there. She said, do you remember when we gave all those donations of books to the school? We filled their library. And I said, no, I don't even remember. And she had a picture of me standing there with yeah. somebody from my company. And apparently, so I must have been on this little thing like, let's give these books to people and don't let any of them get thrown away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful evening, family. It's great seeing yeah. you all. And it's great meeting you, Jay and Sandeep and Muhammad. And whoever Burr I love it. Yes, she's very quiet. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised she's so quiet tonight, but that's okay. That's okay. Thank you. She's here. Thank okay. you. I love these podcasts, Dr. Karen. And I think I can keep here listening to Dr. Massey the whole day. 
Oh, okay. In that case, that's a blessing. Class class will be good again. Okay. Yeah, we should. And Sandeep also asked a very good question, and I'll be prepared for something. Hope not, <laughs> but <laughs> yes, you. they they will construct you... their own podcast, leadership podcast, at the end of residency. So I'm really excited about that. Oh, great! Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Michael. God bless you guys. God bless Thank you. Thank you. You guys, right. I'll see you at 9 a.m. <laughs> give, 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 give Leonard our prayers and blessings over there. Too. I will. I will.